This is the infrared tracking workshop. Uh, as a few of you heard me say, I'm doing this primarily so I never have to answer this question again. We're going to film this and put it as a kind of tutorial on our website so that you can just have this information handy. So um, now in this uh, first iteration, it's the first chance I had since the lights were set up last night. It's the first chance that I had to, um, I haven't actually tr truly tried it yet. So hopefully it's going to go fine. But I would love your uh, ease and relaxing uh, reaction if it doesn't. So let's see how we do, yeah? So why use infrared tracking, OK? Um, Troika Ranch used this technique extensively in a piece we did uh, 10 years ago now. It's called 16 Revolutions. That's when I first did it. And I should give credit to Zach Lieberman. I don't know if any of, of you know him from the Open Frameworks community, but he's the one who taught me how to do it because he and Golan Levin innovated this technique, I think, pretty early on with their piece, Mesa de Voce. If you don't know Mesa de Voce, it's worth taking a look at. It was one of the first pieces I know of that was using this technique, although it was also used. Uh, another important piece is Apparitions by, uh, help me someone, Apparitions. His name will come to me. Anyway, Klaus Obermeier, thank you very much. Yes. So go ahead and hit the space bar. Here are the reasons why you want to use that. The main point is that you can project into the same space in which you are tracking. So if we think about it for a second, if we were just using visible light to track, and that's the way we were picking up the movement of whomever is in front of the camera, then the light from the projector would also be tracked, creating a feedback loop, which means you can't really successfully do it. However, if you ever want to try it, it's sort of interesting to try and do visible light tracking and generate an image and then let it feed back on itself, and you can kind of make a self-generating system. But that's a different piece, right? So that's the main reason that we want to do that. And, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to separate the object of interest from the background. And, and that's always the goal of tracking. The big challenge of any tracking, whether it's the connect or doing color tracking or anything else, it's how do you see that object that you want to see as opposed to the background that you don't want to see, yeah? So this system makes that easy, yeah? And then the other thing is that, at least in the way that we've done it, it's very stable and reliable. I think 16 revolutions of any Troika Ranch show that we got, it had the most performances. I, I don't know the exact count, but it's 30 or 40 performances we got for that show. And this system never failed me, except in what, remind me when I get to the pitfalls section, there was one instance, and when we got into a little trouble with it, I'll tell you about that, um, because learning the pitfalls of this is something I want to make sure and share with you as well. OK? So in my experience, what I'm presenting to you is one way of doing it. Others have done it in other ways. I'll talk a little bit about that. But for me personally, it has been super reliable. OK, the first thing is, how do we make infrared light? There are several ways to do it. I'm going to show you the way I did it. We set this up last night so that we could do this demonstration today. And I don't have the infrared filters in yet because I wanted you to see what this pattern of light looks like. First of all, you want your lights no more than one meter away from the background. Yeah, so here they're even closer than a meter, but it's probably, what, 70 centimeters, something like that. As evenly overlapped as possible, Martin, I don't know, Martin's not here, the technician, he did a great job of getting this really evenly done. And as I'm illustrating to you now, you want to check the coverage before you insert the IR gels. I mean, this is how you can actually see it, because in a moment, I'm actually going to climb up on the ladder and put those in, and you will no longer see any light with your eyeballs, because your eyeballs can't see infrared light, right? So this is your opportunity to make sure that that coverage is nice and even. If you're, we're using profiles here, so we didn't really need to do that. But if you were using uh, Fresnels, and you would definitely want to have barn doors so that you're going to cut that light so that it ends right here, as, as close to here as possible, as to the edge of the stage. You don't, your goal here is to have as little light spilling downstage as possible. Yeah? And then the other really critical factor, because of these gels, is that you, you never want to run the lights at higher than 50% intensity. That's super important. That will become apparent why in just a second, yeah? 
Okay, the gels. How you do this, the way I've done it, is you make a sandwich of four se separate filters. The Roscoe Lux numbers, and someone really sat down and figured this out, like calculated to try and get it as close to the IR spectrum as possible. Roscoe Lux, number 19, you need two of those. Those are the red one. Number 90, which is the green one, and number 83, which is the blue one, okay? The order in which you put these gels into them, I don't think it really matters. But somehow we had this system that we had green, blue, red, red, and we put the green one near the instrument. It really has no, I don't think it really matters in the end, yeah? Okay, our experience was that to be on the safe side, these were good for uh, three performances that were each about an hour long, including setup time, testing, you know, pre-show stuff, yeah? Um, you need to check, you need to check these every single show. Someone has to go up and has to examine them. If they start to look crispy or burnt, you need to replace them. Because the, the absolute biggest pitfall of all with this, and this is why it requires this care to check, if one of these burns through in your show, your dancer will no longer be tracked, the spot on the wall will be tracked, and nothing will happen. That's the big pitfall that you need to avoid. Now, another way to do this, used by uh, such notable people as my friend Frieder Weiss and many others, actually, is that you use infrared LED arrays. Go ahead. I've never used these myself, so I can't say a lot about it because this stuff just worked for me, and if it works, I'm happy, and I don't really need the change. But it might be that they're a little bit more difficult to focus because you can never actually ever see the light. I find this thing of being able to see it kind of comforting because you really see where the light is before you put the gels in. Um, the big advantage is, of course, they're not going to fail because it's, they're going to burn through. That's just not going to happen with those things. And in fact, they're actually very specifically focused in the IR spectrum. The disadvantage I see with those, and again, I, I think from the position of a dance company that's not Pina Bausch or William Forsyth or something like that, I think of it from Troika Ranch, a very modestly sized dance company who doesn't have a lot of budget and for things. You know, shipping cases and moving things around, that adds a lot to the budget if you want to keep things as inexpensive as possible. You don't want to have to carry a lot of that kind of stuff. So with these objects, of course, they have to be carefully protected in terms of the shipping, and that means you've got to deal with cases and those sorts of things. So for me, having these, a roll of gel in my hand is just a lot easier than dealing with these other systems. It may not be the, maybe it's not the best way in the world, but it really has been very successful for me. Okay, the camera, um, there's a few options. In general, what you want is a black and white security camera. And it's important that it's black and white and not color because black and white cameras are sensitive to infrared light and color cameras are not, or not in the same way, and not nearly as sensitive. The other option is that you use a camera, a Sony camera, with the night shot feature. Very important though, in, uh, in all cases, Disable the auto exposure and the auto focus. Often that's not possible on the less expensive security cameras. That's something you need to check for. And then the final part of the little formula here, to make sure that you really block out as much visible light as possible, you need this infrared filter. There may be others, but the one that I use that seems great is Lee number 87. Here we'll start with this. Here's the infrared camera. I mean, it's not infrared yet, but here's the camera, and here's the view. And of course, we're getting, it's just visible light camera at this point, and we get the feedback because it sees the light from the projector and it goes through, yeah? So that's how it looks before we do anything special, yeah? And even if we turn the lights on, the infrared lights, which I'll do quickly here. So remember, 50% only, right, not brighter. And you can look up at them, you can see that they're on, right? But you don't see anything in front of your eyes. And also in the camera, it doesn't see anything yet, yeah? So, so far, we've just got this field of invisible light. But now, step one, at least with the Sony camera, you wouldn't have this step with the black and white camera. I'm gonna turn on the night shot feature. Aha, we see now, do you see them up there, the little bits of light at the top? So now we start to see something, but see the night shot feature by itself is not enough, yeah? Nor would it be, I think, with the infrared camera. 
But here, I have my little infrared filter, and I'm going to put that in front of it. And now we see that what we're left with is just the infrared light. So now I'm going to invite Romy. What's your last name, Romy? OK, good. I didn't know that. So Romy is a student here at the Haze Te, and she's been kind enough to come up and help us out today. Um, she's studying here. And so we're going to see how we can get this to go. So the first thing, though, you can step out for a moment, Romy. I'll just stand to the side there for a second. Now, the fall off on this image from the top to the bottom is a little bit less, I mean, it's a little bit darker than I would hope. I'm going to break my own rule, because we're doing a short demonstration, and I'm going to turn this up to 75 or even 80. So hopefully they won't burn through too quick, and we can do this, just to get a little juice out of them. I want to explain the process of background subtraction. This is, here's how it works. This is what the camera sees. Yeah? And then what we're going to do in a second is that we're going to take a snapshot of that image. Now, Romy, go out for one second and just stand, stand in the middle there, and we'll see your, your shadow for a moment. Just wave your arms a little bit, and then I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to go boom. Now, do you see the top right one just froze, right? OK, you can step out again for a second. I'm just pointing out that the point here is that we're going to get an image, and we're going to, whatever's coming from the live camera, and we're going to um, freeze it. So I've got the background here, because you won't see me freeze it here, because there's nothing in it. So I hit freeze. I hit the button. Now I have the frozen image. And now we're going to see the result of the background subtraction, which I'll show you how to do in a minute. So Romy, go in now, and let's see if we can hopefully see her. OK, there she is. It's faint, but it's there. Can you see her there a little bit? Just move your arms for us a little, maybe. Yeah. So that's down in the, in the bottom left. And then what we're going to do next is we're going to condition that image. You can come back and stay there for just a moment. You can just stand and relax. Um, so what I'm using is I'm using a threshold actor. And we're using the threshold actor to kind of make a distinction between the background and the foreground. The threshold says, if the br brightness is above 7, then we make it white. If the brightness is below 7, we make it black. And that's a way of kind of conditioning the image. I'm going to see if the Luma key will help us here, but I don't know if it will. Maybe a little bit, yeah. No, it's better with. OK, yes, there's a little bit of noise in this image. You'll see, you may not be able to see it. I'm sorry, I have to do this each time I switch the stage, so I'll have to do it again in a second. I'm going to actually keep this small for the moment, just so we can do that. But it looks like a value of 7 is a good value, OK? So that's something you're going to have to find out every time you set up the show, what that perfect value is to be able to isolate the person and really turn them into a nice, sharp image. So you've got the video end watcher here, and that's going into a freeze actor. The freeze actor is going into the effect mixer. Uh, as well as the live feed is also. So you, going into the effects mixer, you have the live feed from the camera, and you also have the frozen image, or what will be the frozen image, yeah? And the critical thing, the mode has to be set to diff, which is difference. That is where it takes one image and it subtracts it from the other mathematically, and that's how background subtraction works. If you have the background, and then you show the background again with something different, when you subtract them, the part that's different is brighter or not black anymore. That's how the whole technique works. So basically, you've got your live feed coming through. When you've got your background set up, you, in this case, you hit letter F to trigger the freeze actor, the grab input. It freezes the background, and then your performers walk in, and you're good to go. That's the basic idea, yeah? So um, the um, the main point here is that we have to get that background, and this is where some of the pitfalls come in. You'll see that in a second. The frozen background with nothing in it, right? You can't have any objects in it. It has to be the scene that's going to be tracked, right? And then by doing that subtraction, you can isolate the performers, yeah? But the other thing that's important here is using a secondary scene because I don't know how many of you know this technique, but this is important because if you put the 
video end watcher, the freeze actor, and the difference actor into each scene, as you move through your show, you would have to somehow capture the background each time, but that's not really reasonable, right? You need to capture it once at the beginning, and then, you, then from that point forward, you just have it for the whole show, yeah? So how do you do that? Well, in Isadora, there's this uh, actor, which you may or may not know, called the Activate Scene Actor. When you say Activate Scene, it means you can turn the scene on even though you're not in it, right? We know the Jump Actor takes us from the current scene to another scene, but the Activate Scene Actor allows you to just activate any scene in, in, the, uh, in the program. It's good to know, by the way, that when you do that, there's almost no overhead. You, you know, if you, this activate scene, actor, uh, activate scene feature is kind of powerful because it's really not any more heavy than having two, uh, one scene. It's the same, really. So you've set up this init scene. I just showed you the init scene. The init scene has the, the keyboard watcher with the jump actor going plus two and the activate scene actor plus one. So when I trigger it, it activates this scene and then it jumps over and ends up over here, thus leaving this scene running for the whole show, right? So at that point, this scene is, is happening all the time and that way you can freeze the image and receive it throughout the rest of the show without having to worry about capturing the background again, yeah? Okay, so um, the final part of the secondary scene thing, and you'll want to take a photo of this one too. Sorry, the text is a little hard to read, I'm afraid. But again, I think I'll just send this out when we're all done. It's basically what I showed you before, except now you see the luminance key actor and the threshold actor. We adjust mainly, it's the threshold. You adjust the value of the threshold until you get a nice image uh, of the performer. Yeah? But here's the key. We use the broadcaster actor to broadcast that video because then we can have a listener actor in any scene and receive the signal from the camera. That's the powerful use of the broadcaster and listener actors is that from this secondary scene, we can be receiving or sending out data. And in fact, we're also receiving it in this one using the rel relatively recent get global values actor. Um, this actor allows, it's like the broadcaster and the listener in a way, except it allows you to say, I want these values to be recognized throughout the program. But in fact, if you manipulate them in real time, they will in fact update. So it works a little bit like the broadcaster and listener, but this is so we can, from any scene that we're in, we can adjust the luminance key, uh, uh, key bottom input and the threshold, threshold input, yeah? So now we have this thing that receives these thresholds so we can adjust that for our show and that we receive the processed image of, with the background subtraction as we go through the rest of the piece. So here, let's, let's, hear, let's say that our show that we're doing happens to have a chair in it, but that's part of the piece. There's a chair and you're gonna do this tracking, right? And so you do the background subtraction. It's pretty good, you've got a little bit of fuzz. So then you're in and you're able, and there I am, you're tracking me, it's wonderful. Oh, by the way, you'll notice that the chair, though, is in my body, right? Because I'm dark and the chair is dark, and now the, the background subtraction, it, it doesn't work there. This can be okay, though, as long as you can still see the body, it's gonna work, right? But here's the real problem. You've moved the chair out of the scene, but the chair is there because you snapped the background picture when the chair was there. And the other problem that's kind of the worst problem, your camera does this. It got knocked by someone's foot or something, okay? So now the background subtraction, because it depends on the background always being consistent and the same, is all fouled up because the camera got moved. When we did 16 revolutions, we, um, the camera and the projector were in the same spot on the floor. I'll explain a little bit about that too in a moment. And we actually put a guard there to make sure that no one could get near it because of course one millimeter of bump on the camera and we'd have to make the audience wait and redo it. Luckily that never happened, right? And in terms of, the, I told you when I, the pitfall that happened to us that was a, a very unexpected one, this, uh, the, the set for 16 revolutions was this kind of translucent plastic that was at the edges and it hung there 
And this, in many shows that we did, it never caused a problem. We were in a rather large venue somewhere in the States. I can't remember, but it was like a really big house. It was all fine. We had done all the calibration. Everything was perfect. It was totally working. We're in the middle of the show, and the air conditioning turned on. And all the things started fluttering like this. And suddenly, I'm, the, the lines are going all over the place in the wrong place, because that background changed. And I'll tell you what I did in that situation. Um, I, because I knew we were in trouble for the rest of the show, I jumped in, I inserted a crop actor, and I cropped down the top part of the image so it was black, so that that part up where the set was moving would be ignored. And we got through the piece that way, yeah? So, and then the other one is that one time in a dress rehearsal, because we really didn't want to stop, near the end of the show, actually, one of, the lamp, one of the IR gels burned through. And then I had this big spot up there, and it was tracking the spot and kind of going be between the dancers. In that situation, there really wasn't anything I could do besides stop, but we really didn't want to stop because it was a dress. So in that case, I just repeatedly was hitting the freeze button, that my little key, F, as the dancer danced. Go ahead, come on in. Yeah, and now we're going to condition that a little bit. And you can feel free to do whatever's fun, Romy. Yeah. So what you're seeing there with those yellow lines are the bounding box of what the I's plus plus module is telling you where that person is. Yeah? So I'm going to just let you take a look at the, what I've done here with this a little bit. And uh, you can relax for just a second, Romy, because we won't be able to see you for a moment. So. Actually, no, come back for a moment. I want to show them something. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So here, I had the threshold on the eyes plus plus actor set to like, I don't know, it was four, I think, as a default. And because of the noise, the slight noise in the signal, it wasn't working. But if you take that threshold and just start moving it up, what you want is you want that red box to just stick really tight around the body of the performer. So it's doing a pretty good job now. And Romy, if you just put your arms out like that, see that? It's just like that red box is staying right on her. Yeah? So that's the key thing, is that once you get this signal coming in, you want to adjust that threshold so that you get this really tight little box around the performer. Also important, because of the noise, can you see the noise here flashing the little dots? One thing that can really help you that's not in the normal eyes module, but is only in eyes plus plus, is the median filter. The median filter, or maybe it's too median. Let's see, that might be too much. Yeah, I think that's bad. That's one, in certain situations, that can help. But also the blur can help you. There's a built-in blur there. And sometimes if you've got noise in the signal, the blur can help you out. Here, if I turn that blur up and turn the threshold up a bit more, you can also get some, in, so that can be helpful in tightening up the image. But it was actually working fine without the blur, so I'm going to set it back to being off, and we've got this nice tracking now, yeah? Okay, so great. We've got this thing. We're able to track the performer. We know where he or she is. It's all working. And now the question becomes, now what? What do you do with this information once you've got it? That's obviously a big question, you know, is what the next step is. I'm not, this, work, this particular workshop isn't about answering that question so much, but I did want to at least propose a couple things that one might think about doing with this once you've got that image, yeah? So a couple of the properties, or the simplest set of properties that we have to look at that the I's++ module will give us is the size of that bounding box, above and below, and then, of course, the center of it, which is where the performer or performers are. Remember, eyes plus plus can track more than one person. It's possible, right? So in fact, if you have two performers, you could have it responding to two of them. However, the thing you have to watch out for, let's see if we can demonstrate that together, Romy. Wait one second. Let me snap the background one more time. I'm going to, right now, I had had set the number of objects to one, but I'm going to set it to two and see if Romy and I can get in there together successfully and have it work. Let's see. Okay, so 
Box around Romy, box around me. Ah, what happened? Our bounding, we, our bounding boxes crossed, right? So that's the other thing is that what eyes can't do is that it can't distinguish between two people if they intersect. So what happens is if we cross, now we're one person, but if I go like this, I'm, let's see, which one is me now, I forgot. Okay, I'm green, right? Let's cross again. I'm still green, but sometimes I'd end up being red. In other words, you lose the ability to know who is who. So you can use this to track more than one person. It actually can be very successful if you are willing to give up the fact, uh, to give up the notion that you're going to know which person is which. Because as soon as you have this kind of occlusion, you're not going to be able to know. And that's just something you have to give up on. But depending on what you're doing with it, that may not be an issue. I've done things where I did this crazy piece in Vancouver where I was tracking all these robots, and they were always bumping into each other. But it didn't matter. I was just making these beautiful lights on them that followed them around, and it was fine because if they got mixed up, it just was another light on the other robot, yeah? All right, so there's our nice bounding box around Romy. Yeah, following her around. So now I'm going to add one element to this. Oh, by the way, see, like, that's really dangerous what just happened. There's, like, light coming in from the side now from the sun. Might foul things up. Let's see what happens. But anyway, so far it seems to be all right. So here's a very simple little particle system. It's all it's doing is causing the little square to stay in the center of Romy's body. Yeah? It's just taking the center of that bounding box and moving it around so it follows her. And if, can you go closer to the screen a little bit? Don't go too close, but let's see how far you can go before it loses you. Actually, that's a good thing to illustrate. Go all the way against the wall. OK, we lost her. She's in the infrared light now. That doesn't work. You have to be downstage of the infrared light. But if you come back towards me a little bit, and it's good, Romy, you can watch the image instead of looking at us just so that you understand what's happening with it too. right? So this is a, just a little simple thing. There's a light following her around. Let's take a next step now with our little image. And so now it's generating more particles but what's happening is it's actually based on the speed of movement. So Romy, what it's analyzing is it's looking at the bounding box and how big and small it gets and how fast it does that. If you start really dancing around, the boxes are going to get bigger and we're going to see more of an image. And if you slow down, the box will be smaller. Yeah. So you have the control of the dynamics of that through the way in which you're moving. So in this limit scale value, 22, 57, because that's the most, the minimum and maximum. So that is going to convert a range of 22 to 57 into 0 to 100. Because our goal is to always end up with a dependable range of numbers that we can use to control something, right? Same thing now, let's see what happens with the other bounding box. Squat down, yeah. So the smallest number is 33 or 30 or even yeah, 24, and then come up now and jump up in the air. OK, I saw 90. But actually, don't do it with your hands up. Just do it, just, just jump. OK, 83. Do you want to go for 84? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, all right, so now we know those ranges. And that's because what I'm doing after that, the next two actors, I'm using the 2D velocity. The 2D velocity takes, as every number comes in, it looks at the, the current number and the previous number, and it basically tells you the difference. And that, ba that is the calculation for velocity. When you have a point and you move to another point, the further apart they are, the greater the velocity, right? So that's what that measures. And since I don't actually have two dimensions, I'm just using y. We don't care about x. x is immaterial at this point, because we're only measuring it in one dimension. Then I add those two velocities together, and together, we have the velocity of the bounding box moving in and out. I mean, sorry, the width of it changing and the height of it changing as one number. Yeah? Let me move the stage and zoom in. You can all take a photo, if you like. This, this little, I'm going to highlight the important actors. These, four, these five actors are what are measuring the velocity of the change of the width and height of the bounding box. Um, then. We have one more limit scale value, which is also 
It's, it's not actually as critical because it's already been, been done. And then a smoother actor, right? Because also this information coming from the, um, the camera tracking can be kind of noisy, and often you want to smooth that out. I'm going to turn that to zero for now to see what it does in terms of how it looks. And then finally, I have this user actor, which I don't really need to open up, that's generating the images. Yeah? So that's the little chain of events. So with her outside the frame already, perfect. All right, come back in, and let's see if it responds a little bit more nicely now that we've calibrated it. There's one last parameter that's there for fun. So there's the boxes. But also I added, I have a 3D projector and this object in the center, turn this down, is looking at her position on the stage and then rotating. OK, I am going to say the last time, I promise. Step out one more time. OK. So we've got the system that's generating the boxes in response to her velocity. But it, we've also got this uh, plane that is rotating to face her wherever she is on the stage. So if she moves over here to the other side, it's kind of, now of course, if you get it to the edge of the frame, Romy, it loses you, so then it gets confused. But as long as you're in the frame, yeah? So. Huh. I, I, I love watching this process. She's never been in this system before, but as any intelligent dancer would, and uh, she's immediately seeing, what does this instrument do? How do I play this instrument? What is its sensitivity? I, I mean, this process for me is so, much, is so much fun, and it's so interesting to see how different people respond to what they can do and how they can sort of also get the computer in trouble on purpose sometimes. <laughs> it's really nice. OK, I think we'll stop there. Romy, thank you so much. That's basically it. That's how it works.